So, okay, part two. Now we move on to this process, uh, this mean reverting process here. So if this equation looks uh, familiar to you, it should. It's basically very similar to the, um, to the Brownian motion we did a few years ago. It's basically the exact same thing, except for this drift term here is modified to kind of have a term that pulls it back towards the mean. So we're going to generate a sequence of data using this. And the way we're going to do this, you can think of this dx and dt as... Um, you know, differentials in a differential equation. So we're going to just approximate these differentials as a, a um, as a uh, very small difference. So we're going to write it out here uh, like this. So this is how we're going to build out our uh, kind of uh, simulated data set. We're just going to approximate the differentials as a small difference where kind of this time interval dt um, t sub i minus t sub i sub 1 is, is fairly small. And then we have to add in the square root term to kind of scale down the volatility to the appropriate uh, appropriate value. Um, one more thing I should say about this is if you look at this uh, process on Wikipedia, let's go to the Wikipedia page on here. Um, maybe you can zoom in a little bit. You notice that they uh, have written it with theta and mu kind of interchanged uh, as to where I have them placed. So I'm going to do it this way because this is the way the book, um, book has it. I'm not quite sure why the book does it the, this way, but um, this is the, this is the notation I'm going to keep. So let's come down here and define a bunch of uh, let's define a theta mu and sigma just for the sake of uh, simulation. And again, let's just set a constant random seed uh, just so that our numbers are reproducible. Okay, so these are the values we're going to use. We're going to set theta equal to 1, mu to 1.5, and sigma to 0.3. Uh, let's set some time values. Let's just do 0 to 100, and we'll do... Um, we'll do basically a thousand one point, so we have a nice even uh, spacing. So let's do t is equal to np.lin space, zero comma 100, 1001 points. Okay, that runs. And now our dt is just gonna be equal to t uh, one minus t zero. Okay, does that run? Yes, it does. Uh, let's pick an initial value of our, um, well, first let's just define a vector of zeros. Let's say our, uh, we're going to store our data in the vector x, and that's going to be equal to mp dot zeros, and it's going to be the same size as t, so I'm just going to do t dot shape, okay? And let's just pick a, an initial value for our first data point, so x0 is equal to, um, well, since I think this thing is going to be pulled back towards the value of 1, let's just set it equal to 1.1. And now uh, we can do this a ver variety of ways. I'm just going to do it by looping over the, um, um, by uh, just uh, just by using a loop. So we're going to loop over our um, our indices. And so our next value x at i plus one is equal to x i. So basically, I'm just rearranging this equation, moving this uh, i minus one. I probably should have written these. Um, this probably should be like i plus 1 minus x sub i, but I, I wrote it this way instead. So I'm just rearranging this equation and uh, building our loop this way. So it's this plus, plus what? Our mu term, mu times theta uh, minus x sub i uh, times dt. And now we need to add in our volatility terms. So that's our sigma square root of dt, and then our sample from the normal distribution. So let's see uh, if I screwed anything up here. Apparently not. Uh, let's just come up here and plot it out. So plt.plot x. In fact, let's put in uh, both t and x here. Something seems really funny about this. Um, it's not centered about the right value. What did I type wrong here? Oh, Christ, I'm surprised it didn't give me a syntax error. That should be a plus. There we go. That looks more reasonable. So we kind of get a random oscillation about uh, the point uh, y equals 1. So the authors of the book calculate uh, basically the equivalent of this distribution up here, the normal distribution for this. Uh, I'm not going to do that because it's one of those situations where it's like, I'm glad they did it because God knows I'm not going to sit down and actually derive such a thing. 
So this is the equation they get for basically the function that it's going to give us the likelihood. As you can see, it's kind of a bit of a mess, but it kind of actually looks like a normal uh, distribution if you make some substitutions in here. So this sigma tilde squared is equal to this. Um, but otherwise, it's kind of very similar to a, a normal distribution. So let's write a function that returns that so we can calculate our likelihood and log likelihood and then kind of re um, redo the minimization procedure we did above, but with these data and this function here. Okay, so I did this off of the recording just so I could type it all in and make sure there were no typos. I kind of built it in a piecemeal way just for uh, debugging purposes. So we have this uh, sigma tilde squared, which I called sigma naught here. Um, this prefactor term here is this, you know, one over the square root term here. And then the rest of it is just kind of tacked on and then we return the, the value of f. So let's now uh, create a function that returns basically the log likelihood of our data set. So I'm going to create a function called log likelihood. Um, I'm going to put an OU for Ornstein Ullenbeck just uh, to keep it uh, distinct from our other functions. So this is going to take our parameter vectors. Which, um, that's going to be our mu, theta, and sigma. I'm going to call that P just as, as I did above in the previous uh, previous section is we're going to need our experimental data, which is going to be our x, and our uh, dt, our time step. So again, I'm going to extract, um, oops, I called these parameters here in p up top, but I'm going to extract our parameters from our uh, input vector. Remember, these have to come in as a vector, and just for the sake of convenience, I'm going to pull them out into their own uh, variables. Uh, since we have a bunch of data points, we're going to just do this with a loop. Um, it could probably be done in a vectorized way, kind of like above, but um, since this is, you know, we have to look at uh, adjacent data pairs, you know, x1 and x2, for example. Uh, it's probably just easier to do with a loop. So the number of points is going to be equal to x dot size. And uh, the data we're going to return, I'm going to pre-allocate this uh, here as a bunch of zeros initially. We're going to return f, so that's going to be this f here. And it's of length n minus 1, because remember, we have this difference in we have x1 and x2, so we can't go beyond the end of our array. So uh, that vector is going to be one uh, point shorter. OK, so here's our loop. And again, for bookkeeping purposes, I'm going to pull out x1 and x2 from this uh, big x vector here. And then I just populate these vectors by calling this uh, function up here, which I called OU, which is basically just this equation here. And now we just need to uh, take the log of it, sum it, and then we return the negative value. So let's just say f is equal to np.log f, and then f is equal to np.sum f. So I'm kind of creating a vector of these uh, individual uh, likelihoods. I am taking the log of it and then adding them up. And now we just send this back out of the function. So return, and again, we need to do the negative because we're trying to find a maximum, whereas our, our uh, scipy function returned uh, calculates a minimum. Uh, this needs to be out of the for loop, doesn't it? So that's there. That should be there. And that should be there. Any obvious typos? Apparently not. And just as in the previous video, we have some constraints. Uh, in the previous video, we saw that sigma had to be greater than zero. Uh, and in this case, uh, P1, which is mu, has to be greater than zero, as well as sigma being great, greater than zero. So these are our constraint functions, functions which uh, I named constraint one and two. Let's run that. And now we're ready to call our minimize function. So let's come down here. Uh, we need to create a dictionary for our constraints. So here's our constraint uh, dictionary. So both of them are inequalities. They're greater than or equal to zero. And then the name of the functions. Let us create a vector P0 of initial guesses. And let's just go one, one, one. I have no idea. Well, in principle, we don't know um, what these parameters mu, sigma, and theta are. So let's just do that. Come down here. So let's call minimize. Our log likelihood function, which we want to minimize, is this one. Our initial guess is P0. Our args are um, x and dt. And our constraints 
is equal to con. So let's see if that actually runs. And these values don't look particularly good. Theta seems about, uh, sigma seems about right, but these two are way off. Yeah, and our function value should be really small. This, uh, this looks off. So let me see if I can figure out what's going on here. Okay, after poking around and looking at why I was getting a divide by zero error, it turns out that as some of these parameters are being adjusted by the code, uh, this function here um, is returning a zero value, and then we're taking the log of that, and that's what's causing the problem. Um, there are two possible solutions here. One is just to come down here and make um, our sigma value slightly larger, because it's getting close to zero, which is causing a problem, as is our value with mu, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> which is set in constraint one here. But if we make this 0 0.1, Uh, you see you get the better values here. This is what we'd expect. Um, <clears throat> that's a bit of a hack, and I'm not really happy with it. So let's come up here and get rid of it. And then I, earlier I had added some code to search for these zeros here. And again, this is a, still a bit of a hack, but it does work. Um, if the value in this f vector is zero, we set it equal to a small number. I happen to pick 10 to the minus 8. Run, run and we get decent numbers. Now it turns out that the authors of the book managed to calculate analytical solutions for this so we don't really have to do any of this minimization stuff. We could just create a formula and plug in directly to that. So let me type out um, what they did here. So the first thing they do is divide, uh, come up with a bunch of basically dummy variables to represent these summations. There are one, two, three, four, five of them here. And then after doing all the calculus and all the mathematics, you get these analytic expressions for the optimal parameters. So we have theta, mu, and sigma. So let's implement these in code, and hopefully they will agree with the values we got with our numerical optimization here. So let's come down here and do that. So here are the values that they define up here. Um, pretty straightforward. Uh, they're just summations of vectors. Just have to be aware that sometimes the indices here that they're summing over are a bit bit tricky. So for example, this one, it's the product of x minus 1, x sub i minus 1 times x sub i. So that's kind of reflected here. So let's run that and make sure I didn't screw something up. It looks okay. And now it's just a matter of transcribing these formulas here. So let's do that. So here are our terms, theta, mu, and uh, sigma. And I wrote this here as sigma 0, 2, uh, because this this formula here gives us sigma squared. So let's print all of those. So print theta 0, print mu zero and if it isn't obvious the zero just means the optimal subscript here i'm just trying to mimic their star notation here in my code so print uh we need to take the square root of it so it's mp dot sqrt sigma zero does it run except for the that sigma zero two for the squared right there we go. So we get 971.51.323. What do we get up here? 0 0.97156. So that number is a tiny bit different. And 3239. What did we get down here? 3234. So they differ in the fourth decimal point, uh, decimal place here. So yeah, that's all. That's it uh, for parameter extractions from uh, Ornstein Ullenbeck. Uh, in the subsequent videos, we'll apply this to actual uh, pairs trade data. We'll look at gold, uh, gold versus uh, GDX, which is the gold miner ETF, and gold versus SLV, which is the uh, it's a ETF that tracks the price of silver. So, anyways, I'm going to clean up this notebook because it's kind of on the sloppy side. Uh, make sure that everything is correct and there are no typos in these equations. Uh, put it up on GitHub as usual. And that's about it.